Shem and Eber in the future promised land. But before we get too deep into the video, first I want to tell you guys about my social media platforms. So I have a Clubhouse account and we can actually talk to one another on it. I also host Clubhouse rooms every now and then where I might talk about history and genetics of the Middle East and Africa. I have a Twitter page, a Facebook account, and a Facebook page, as well as a Instagram, all titled The Hebrew of Israel. And what I typically do on these platforms is post upcoming videos as well as um, slides for my presentations. And so just be on the lookout for all of that on my social media platforms. And if you want to support me financially for the channel, you can look at my Patreon as well as my PayPal and my GoFundMe. And with all of that out of the way, let's begin with the video. This chapter one covers creationism. If you take a literal approach to the scriptures, the Most High created the earth in six days and he rested on the seventh. And then Genesis chapter two covers the Garden of Eden. Now, where was the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 through 14 says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and Oxenstone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hidekel. It is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Now as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, I believe when it came to the world before the flood from a young earth perspective would have been more like Pangaea, entire continent, one continent for the whole planet. And the four rivers would be basically the Nile River, the Red Sea, and the, of course, Euphrates and Tigris River. And the Garden of Eden itself would be Israel. So here's a closer image. Here's a wide image, and I'll get a bit closer on the next one. So here it is. Uh, basically, when it comes to the land of Nod, because, of course, Nod is mentioned, the land of Nod would have been unironically the land of Babylon or in that territory that will become future Babylon and uh, as you can see Eden would have been in the area of the Levant or Israel and then you have the very various rivers coming from Africa and the Middle East filtering the land and basically Eden would be Africa Eden the land will be Africa but of course the garden was eastward of Eden, and so in this case, uh, this would be Israel, the land of Israel. And so this is the way I sort of envision uh, the land of Eden and the garden of Eden. Eden, Africa, the garden is Israel, which is east of Africa. Genesis chapter 5 covers from Adam to Noah. This is the genealogy. And of course, this is important because all humans descend from Noah and specifically his sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. We're all Noahites. Genesis chapter 6 covers the ark. And of course, the ark is what saved our ancestors, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, from the great flood. And Genesis chapter 7, of course, mentions the flood. A flood that would have covered the whole earth from a young earth perspective. 
the earth would have been, as I said before, Pangaea, and the flood would have covered it and broke apart under the waters, and this is how we have our modern world today. There are various videos, as I showed before, that can cover how this would have happened from a young earth perspective. I have a playlist called Young Earth Creationism that you can check out, but basically the tectonic plates would have broke apart under the waters during the flood, creating the modern continents of today. Uh, Genesis chapter 8 covers the ark resting, everybody coming off the ark, all the animals, and it's, I believe that when it came to the resting of the ark, it would have been around the area of Mount Judy. Uh, this is a place uh, known by both early Christians and even in Islamic tradition that the ark would have rested around that area. The Jewish, Babylonian, Syriac, Islamic, and early Christian traditions identify Mount Judy or Kuri as a peak near or northeast of the town of Jezret Ibn Abur at the headwaters of the Tigris River near the modern border with Syria and that of Iraq. And there are various mentions of Mount Judy in the Samaritan Pentateuch, Book of Jubilees, Josephus, Julius Africanus, and many others. Many people say that Mount Judy was the place where the ark rested. And so here is a visual representation of where Mount Judy is. As they said, it is near Syria and Iraq, uh, northern Syria, northern Iraq, and southern Turkey. And this is a perfect place for the ark to rest, for all humans to disperse from, and all animals to disperse from, going into the continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe. It's dead center. And I will actually have a video playlist that covers that, because many biblical archaeologists seem to have found the ark of Noah at Mount Judy. Here is a shape, uh, a very interesting shape in that region that could show that a ship was there and that it split. And how do you get a massive ship in the middle of land today? I think it would make a lot of sense that this would be, this is just the leftovers of the ark and how the dirt would have covered it and how it would have slightly sunk into the ground after all that time. And I will have a playlist of videos that can prove Mount Judy is the ark where Noah, uh, where Noah and Shem, Ham, and Japheth would have left from. And you can check that out in my playlist. Now, Genesis chapter 11 mentions the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 through 6. Now... The whole earth had one language and one speech. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower, whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole world. But the Lord came down to the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the tower. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And here's just a good, interesting representation of all the languages that would have just popped out from the Tower of Babel. But the Tower of Babel likely would have been in modern-day Iraq, somewhere near the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. And now we begin with Shem. Since he is our main and you know first target, for the ancestors of the Afro-Asiatic Semitic peoples, he's the main person we got to look at. Remember, according to the genealogy, the Israelites descend from Shem. This is a paternal lineage. 
and they would be a Afro-Asiatic Semitic people. I believe Shem and his descendants would have settled around Mesopotamia, specifically in the Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf is a perfect place where I believe uh, Shem and all of them would have been, all the Semites. And uh, here's just another map showing the Persian Gulf and the area where the Euphrates River and Tigris River would have split. And here's just another visual representation. A lot of the early cities were also near the Persian Gulf where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers are. But I believe Shem at some point would have left the Persian Gulf and settled in the future promised land or, you know, the land of Israel. And so there would have been a migration uh, going from the west to the from the east to the west. The reason for leaving would have been due to the wickedness of the people. But with that being said, what evidence do I have that Shem could have settled the future promised land of Israel? Well, one of the best evidence that I have is that Shem could be Melchizedek. Melchizedek was mentioned in the scriptures as being a king and priest of the city of Jerusalem. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20 says that Melchizedek is the king of Salem, and that he is the priest of the God Most High. In scripture, Noah says that blessed by the Lord God of Shem. The God of Shem is very interesting because this leads me to believe the mantle was passed down from Noah to Shem. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Genesis chapter 9, verse 26. The story from creation to the fall of man to the flood and the knowledge of God was likely passed down. The people who preserved the truth was from the lineage of Shem. This is why there is ancient tradition that Shem is Melchizedek. This is from a Chabadet dot org who named Jerusalem and it says an ancient tradition tells us that Melchizedek was actually one and the same as Shem the son of Noah and that Shalom was was none other than the very place that Abraham would eventually rename Ryan so Shalom is the second half of Ryan plus Shalom, which is Yerushalem. In the Bible, Melchizedek was the king of Salem and priest of El Elyon, tra uh, often translated as Most High God. He is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20, where he brings out bread and wine and then blesses Abraham, or Abram and El Elyon. Chesrelic literature, specifically Torgrum Jonathan, Torgrum Yashua, and the Babylonian Talmud re represents the name in Hebrew right there as a nickname title for Shem. I believe that's uh, Melchizedek in Hebrew, if I know my Hebrew correctly. But I believe Eber would have also left Mesopotamia because of the Tower of Babel when they began to build it. The name Eber or Ivri means to cross over. Where, where would Eber have crossed over from? He would have crossed over the Euphrates River, much like Abraham. So Eber it means region beyond in the Hebrew. And Eber is a very important figure because we see in Scripture the lineage goes from Shem to Eber. In a sense, you can see the passing of the torch. Genesis chapter 9, verse 26. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 21. And the children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. As you can see, it skips our fact side and 
Shila, and it goes straight to Eber. It's very interesting. Shem or Eber could have been Melchizedek. But one thing is for certain, that I do believe a type of priesthood may have been centered around them, or at least these two men were the essential figures for a continuing of the traditions and oral history of the first chapters of Genesis. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High. He And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered our enemies into your hand, and give him a tithe of all. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20. In pre-Mosaic times, priestly duties were performed by the father or patriarchal head of the family or tribe. In patriarchal times, uh, the, the office was held and its duties were discharged by those who occupied some sort of headship, and particularly by the father or the chief of the family and of the tribe. Thus Noah, in his capacity of priest and in behalf of his household, built an altar unto Yahuwah and took of every clean beast and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar, which is mentioned in Genesis chapter 22, verse 13. Melchizedek was priest, God of the Most High. Genesis chapter 14, 18. Isaac built an altar there and called upon the name Yahuwah. Genesis chapter 26 through 25. As did Jacob in Genesis chapter 33, verse 20. In this case, priestly acts were performed by the patriarchs in their capacity as fathers of the family or head of clans. From the beginning, priesthood was in acts of explanation and of worship, was thus recognized as a divinitively institution, uh, instituted office. And so, as you can see from the chart above, Noah carried the priesthood through the flood, and it would have been passed on to Shem, then Eber, and then the next one who was alive when Eber died would have been Abraham. And, you know, this is from uh, Adam Becker. I agree that Melchizedek was either Shem or Eber. Uh, both were in line of the priesthood and their lives overlap Abraham's. And when he means that, he's saying that, you know, when it comes to the genealogies mentioned in Genesis, that, you know, if you take this to be literal, Shem and Eber both would have lived around the time when Abraham was born. But not only that, uh, Eber actually would have outlived Abraham as well, to a slight degree. But here's the genealogies. You have Shem, and then you have Eber, and then you have Abraham right here. And they actually, you know, Abraham would have been alive. Well, Shem and Eber would have been alive around the time of Abraham. So it's fairly interesting. So either Shem or Eber was, you know, at the time, king of the nearby city of Salem, which was across a small valley from the city Jeru, which later merged together into a single city, Jerusalem. The priestly line passed from Shem to from Noah, Shem, Eber, and Abraham, then on down the line of Levi. Now, there is an interesting tradition that Eber was not part of the building of the Tower of Babel, and because of this, he kept his Semitic tongue. Uh, this belief is held by both Jews and Arabs. Eber was the first grandson of the first, was the great grandson of Shem and an ancestor of Abraham. The earth was divided in the time of Eber's son Peleg, mentioned in Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, as well as 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 19, which may re refer to the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 10, verse 32, as well as Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. 
Tradition states that Eber and his descendants refused to help with the building of the Tower of Babel and thus preserve the original human language, which might have been Hebrew. In Jewish tradition, Eber, the, the great-grandson of Shem, refused to help with the building of the Tower of Babel, so his language was not confused when it was abandoned. He and his family along ret retained the original human language, Hebrew, a language named after Eber or Hebrew, also called lingua, ling, lingua humana, humana in Latin. 13th century Muslim historian Abu al Fined relates a story noting that the patriarch Eber, great grandson of Shem, refused to help in the building of the Tower of Babel, so his language was not confused when it was abandoned. And so, this is very interesting because this fits perfectly with Eber and his family leaving Mesopotamia and living in the future land of Israel. Like I said, I do believe a type of mantle was passed down from Noah to Shem to Eber and Melchizedek. Genesis chapter 9 verse 26, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, Genesis chapter 10 verse 21, and the children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. Genesis chapter 14 verse 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest of God most high. So that's very interesting. Like I said, Melchizedek could be Shem or Eber, but he could be someone else entirely. But one of the key things to take from this is that there was a king slash priesthood that followed the God of Shem. Keep that in mind. There was a king and priesthood that followed and knew about the God of Shem. And two, there was a king that was ruling in Jerusalem. So why is this important? Well, Jerusalem is one of the oldest cities in the Levant. Therefore, the name Jerusalem is a Semitic name. This is from Britannia, uh, ancient origins of the city. The earliest traces of human settlement in the city area found on a hill to the southeast are from the late Chalcolithic period, or Copper Age, and early Bronze Age. Excavations have revealed that a settlement ex existed on a site south of the Temple Mount, and a massive town wall was found just above the Gihon Spring, which, determ which determined the location of the ancient settlement. The name known in its earliest form as Yer Jerusalem is probably a Western Semitic, probably of Western Semitic origin, and apparently means foundation of Shalom, God. Very interesting. A biblical narrative mentions the mentions the meeting of a Canaanite Melchizedek, said to be king of Salem, Jerusalem, with the Hebrew patriarch Abraham. Jerusalem is roughly dated to the late copper to early Bronze Age. The oldest part of the city was settled in the 4th millennium BCE, making Jerusalem one of the oldest cities in the world. Uh, there, the Gihon Spring uh, attracted shepherds who camped near the water between 6,000 and 7,000 years ago, leaving behind sacramics uh, and flint artifacts during the Chalcolithic or Copper Age. 4,500 4, through 3,500 BCE. And this is from uh, Shilion and Shilwa, a visitor's guide. And it says the first 3,000 years, 5,000 to 2,000 BCE, near the river that flowed down the slope of the hill and the stream at its base, shepherds would occasionally set their camps, set their camp with their flocks. Their presence is marked by sacraments and flint artifacts 6,000 through 7,000 years old. Hundreds of years later, permanent houses began to be built. And about 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, which is around 3,000 BCE, the place had already become a small village. 
whose resident residents used the natural caves in the side of the mountains for burial. And this is from Haaretz, why is Jerusalem called Jerusalem? Going by the archaeological evidence found so far, Jerusalem was founded about 6,000 years ago, and it may have may have had roughly the name from the beginning. And this is from World History Encyclopedia, Jerusalem. There is material evidence of occupation in the Chalcolithic period, 4,500 through 3,400 BCE, and the Middle Bronze Age II period, which was 18,000 through 15,000 BCE. And this is from History.com. History, early history of Jerusalem. Scholars believe the first human settlements in Jerusalem took place during the early Bronze Age, somewhere around 3,500 BCE. All right, so we are likely dealing with a Semitic population in the Levant. The city of Jerusalem that Melchizedek ruled under is known is a known ancient city, and the name Jerusalem or Jerusalem is Semitic. Abraham met Melchizedek. So one, they could understand each other. When they were speaking, it's likely clear that they both were speaking a Semitic language. Two, they both followed similar Semitic customs. The customs mentioned in that chapter when, when Abraham meets Melchizedek, all those customs are very Semitic. And three, they both were aware or served and knew about the God of Shem, because obviously that's mentioned in the scripture. And four, Jerusalem is an ancient Levantine city with a Semitic name. And that's the fourth most important thing to keep in mind. So this shows that there was likely a Semitic population in the Levant long before Abraham arrived. And this is what I'm basically trying to establish. Abraham was not the first Semite. He likely wasn't the first Semite to come into the land of the Levant. There likely were Semites in the Levant before Abraham arrived. Since we have Semitic names, ancient Semitic cities, uh, long before he came there, uh, and he met um, Semitic people with Semitic customs. So Semites were likely in the Levant. Descendants of Shem were likely in the Levant long before Abraham arrived. And the fact that Jerusalem dates to the late copper to early bronze age is interesting because this is when proto-Semitic began to expand. Remember what this paper says. And by the way, if, you, if you're new to this paper, this is the Bayesian phylogenetic analysis of Semitic languages identifies an early bronze age origin of Semitic in the Near East. And so Reading what's in yellow, it says, We estimate that Semitic had an early Bronze Age origin in the Levant, followed by an expansion of Akkadian into Mesopotamia. This fits the exact same time period as this city, as this Semitic city of Jerusalem. The, reading what's in yellow, the earliest traces of human settlement in the city area found on a hill to the southeast are from the late uh, Chalcolithic period, Copper Age, and the early Bronze Age. The name known in its earliest form is form as Jerusalem, is probably of Western Semitic origin and apparently means foundation of Shalom. Very interesting. When you combine this with the tradition that Eber kept his Semitic tongue because he wasn't part of the Tower of Babel, it's very compelling to believe that the early descendants of Shem, specifically from the lineage of Eber, could have settled the Levant. Basically, they could have left before the Tower of Babel, going into the Levant. But, however, if we were to leave out the idea of Eber losing his language, like let's just hypothetically say, okay, let's not go with that narrative, that Eber didn't lose his tongue. From a biblical point of view, you likely could have had Semites in the Levant before Abraham arrived anyways. The Semitic culture that Melchizedek followed and the Semitic, Semitic city of Jerusalem is evidence of that. We have literal archaeological evidence that there were Semites in the Levant before Abraham. Archaeology would back this up since there is overwhelming evidence that proto-Semitic people and that the proto-Semitic language originated in the Levant. Uh, you know, wh why 
is this important? Or how could this be? Well, it's likely because Eber, because Shem and Eber and his family lived there. This is why we see the priesthood and kingship of Jerusalem in Israel and not in Mesopotamia. And I think that's the most powerful thing to also keep in mind. The priesthood and the kingship isn't anywhere in Mesopotamia, Iraq, or Syria, or Anatolia, or Turkey. It's specifically in the Levant. It's in Israel. The priesthood and the kingship. It's very, very interesting and important. Then, from the Levant, Semites and the Semitic language and people would have spread back into Mesopotamia, which is you know, what I'm referring to when it comes to the language aspect. As we can see here from the Bayesian model, Semites being in the Levant would have sort of had a back to Mesopotamia migration in a sense. And they also would have spread into Arabia and Africa. So from a biological and genetic point of view, what population would early descendants of Shem be? The early descendants of Shem would likely be the Basil Eurasians. Basil Eurasians are ancient Middle Easterners. Indigenous Middle Easterners are descendants of Basil Eurasians. Their origins lie around the Arab Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf is actually where I believe early descendants of Shem were to begin with. So the genetic basin of this area around the Gulf Cemetery Basin is a potential source of the Basal Eurasian origin. High levels of Basal Eurasian ancestry were found in ancient Middle Eastern genomes, which neg neg negatively correlated with Neanderthal ancestry. Basal Eurasians may have less Neanderthal ancestry than other ancestral Eurasian lineages, and the extent to which Basal Eurasian ancestry is present is present may explain the extent to which Neanderthal ancestry is present in Middle Eastern genomes. For, for an example, a high level of Basal Eurasian or Sub-Saharan African ancestry could be the underlying reason for the low level of Neanderthal ancestry in Qatari Bedouin in, in comparison to Europeans or other Middle Eastern populations. Bedouins who are who have the highest level of autochthonous or indigenous Arab genetic ancestry may be the direct descendants of Basal Eurasians. So the most indigenous Middle Easterners have this Basal Eurasian ancestry. And this is from projecting ancient ancestry in modern Arabian, the modern day Arabians and Iranians, a role, a key role of the past exposed Arabo Persian Gulf of human migrations. And so it reads East Arabians also display the highest levels of Basal Eurasian lineage of all tested modern day populations. Not surprisingly, East Arabians were also the ones with higher similarity with Ibero Marusians, who were so far the best proxy for the Basal Eurasians amongst the known ancient specimens. Our results are strong evidence to, to include the exposed basin of Arabo Persian Gulf as a possible homeland of Basal Eurasians to be, uh, to be investigated further, on namely by searching ancient Arabian human specimens. The highest levels of Basal Eurasian lineage found in East Ara Arabo Persia re reinforce previous genetic and archaeological evidence of early human settlement in the exposed basin of the Arabo Persian Gulf. Thus, the exposed basin of the Arabo Persian Gulf is a possible homeland of Basal Eurasians. A branch of Basal Eurasians would have migrated to the Levant. These basal Eurasians would become the ancestors of Natufians. And we conclude with this video. Shem and Eber in the future promised land. And our next episode is Eber and Azurad. Who 
are the descendants of Cush. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video and leave a comment if you have any questions concerning uh, the topic of the video and the series and have a great day.